From CBS New York in color, Face the Nation, a spontaneous and unrehearsed news interview with the Apollo 8 astronauts, Colonel Frank Borman, the command pilot of the mission, Captain James Lovell, who has logged more hours in space than any other man, and Lieutenant Colonel William Anders, for whom the trip to the moon was his first voyage into space. You three gentlemen were the first men to escape from the Earth, so to speak. Is there, I'm sure you're going to be asked this over and over again, but I think everybody wonders about it. Is there some kind of a psychological wrench when you see the Earth actually receding, when you're alone in the universe and the only spot in the whole visible universe is an Earth which is so distant that it looks like, as I believe one of you said, like a quarter or something of that sort? Is there some kind of a feeling where, which might seriously affect people who are not like you, trained, experienced? In other words, if you had a passenger aboard who were not so busy, would he really feel a wrench? never thought a bit about what it might mean to people on Earth. I only know what it felt like to me. What they should have sent was poets, because I don't think we captured in its entirety the grandeur of what we had seen. We were the first ones to see it in color, you know, from that altitude. Nobody had ever seen anywhere close to that. I mean, at best, they'd see the horizon out like this. You don't see cities. You don't see boundaries. You don't see countries. You don't see people. Uh, it looks like the place is uninhabited. into orbit and then inj injected to the moon, there was absolutely no prior thinking about what the Earth would look like. Zero. And it was only when we were separated from the booster and able to turn around and sort of catch our breath and uh, float over to a window that I say, wow, look at that, to myself. And neither Frank nor Jim had ever seen anything like that either. There isn't that much difference between the Earth and the orbit. It's only when you get into deeper space that you, uh, you experience the, the total immersion in the heavens. The Earth was the only thing in the entire universe. Of all this inky black void, the Earth was there with a beautiful blue hue to it. The blue marble, that's, that's what it looked like, a blue marble, a blue agate. I had trouble orienting myself because I didn't know which end was north, which end was up. And I worked my way down from the South Pole, Antarctica, and was able to identify continents and whatnot, and realized that, well, okay, that brown thing off to the right was the bulge of Africa. And then as things started popping out, I could see uh, Florida and the, the tongue of the ocean down at the Bahamas, very blue. And I thought, oh my God, this is amazing.
This was the first time that we actually escaped from the Earth. And at that time, I suddenly realized that everything in life is relative. When you're in a room, your world revolves around those walls. When you're outside, then your world revolves around what your eye can see. And suddenly when you're in a spacecraft, you think in terms of, of oceans, of islands. There was essentially zero interest in images of Earth from space. Nobody told me to take a picture of the Earth. I didn't think about it either. NASA interest was focused on the mission. And particularly Borman was kind of anti-photography. It was just one more thing to divert the crew to actually completing the mission, which was to go around the moon and get back alive. We didn't have any specific directions of the use of photography. We were all on the Earth, so we all knew about the Earth. They wanted photographs of something that was unusual, close-ups of the far side of the moon, and the Earth was strictly secondary. We had Hasselblad 70 millimeter cameras with a magazine that held 200 exposures of thin-based film. Looking back at the Earth, I'm thinking, man, that's pretty. I wonder what the right f-stop would be. Well, I always took three or four. We had what today would be a very rudimentary uh, uh, TV system, a, a camera. first, uh, but eventually people on the ground were able to see something that, that resembled an illuminated sphere called the Earth, and uh, it wasn't, wasn't high definition by any means. And just hold her, hold her steady, it's really looking good. I was wrong on things at times, and I was terribly wrong on the television. I didn't even want to take a television camera with us. That was stupid on my part. The television uh, brought back the realities of what we were doing to the American people, with the people of the world. We've been uh, 31 hours, about 20 minutes into flight. So we'll be signing off here and uh, looking forward now, of course, till the day after tomorrow when we'll be uh, just 60 miles away from the moon.
When you're in the space between the Earth and the Moon, it's entirely different than when you're going around the Earth. Between the Earth and the Moon, as you look out one window, if the Sun is in that quadrant, you see Sun and it's light as day. You look out the other window, and it's pitch black, because that window is in the shadow of the spacecraft. The dark side was like a night without a moon on a high Arizona desert. Uh, the skies are enormously illuminated by stars, more stars than you can imagine. The moon is orbiting this way, and we're aiming for the front of the moon, the leading edge of the moon. The moon is going, as I recall, something like 3,000 miles an hour. And when we get behind the moon, we fire the rocket to slow us up so we will be captured by the lunar gravity. If we hadn't fired that rocket, we would have just gone back and slingshotted back to the Earth. Apollo 8, Houston, one minute to LOS, all systems go. As we came into the shadow of the moon, suddenly it was infinitely black and I looked out and there were stars everywhere. And then as I looked out my side window, suddenly the stars stopped and there was this black hole. And I kind of, I, the hairs went up on the back of my neck. And then I realized that that was the moon blocking out the stars. It was really black. And uh, that brought up a uh, animalistic feeling. We were looking at a portion of the moon that human eyes had never seen before. The moon might have been what the Earth looked like before life. Like we were back at the beginning. I can remember feeling that way. It was a, a poignant moment. Space is black. Black. Ink black. Velvet black. There is no color to space, just as there is no color to the moon. The moon is all shades of gray. Bill Anders, Jim Lovell, and myself have spent uh, the day before Christmas up here uh, doing experiments, taking pictures, and uh, firing our spacecraft engines to maneuver around. What we'll do now is follow the trail that we have been following all day and take you on through to a lunar sunset. The moon is a vast, lonely, forbidding type existence or expanse of nothing. It looks rather like clouds and clouds of pumice stone. And it certainly would not be a very inviting place to live or work. My job was to make sure the spacecraft kept running. And oh, by the way, if I had any time, I, would, I was the photographer as well. I was the guy stuck with the camera. It was a tangential job, and once I could show that the spacecraft was working well, my job was to take pictures of those craters. You know, it wasn't a Ansel Adams proposed just right shades of gray. It was take the goddamn crater and move on to the next one. I start out setting up the cameras and uh, taking pictures according to my photographic flight plan. No matter how closely you looked, it was crater upon crater. It was interesting, but after about an hour, I'm thinking, you know, it's kind of boring. We've been spending all these revolutions looking at the moon. Then as we come around this non-inviting place, we look up and there's the Earth. It's 240,000 miles away. It was small enough you could cover it with your thumbnail. And everything we held dear, 
our families, our country, everything I had to do was back on that blue planet. That was a sense of awe. How in the world could this little ball, you know, exist in this vast universe of nothing? The fact that the lunar horizon was so ugly and stark, that uh, amplified the beauty of the Earth. Wow, is that pretty? We were all awestruck by uh, the difference, the beauty of the Earth and its color against the blackness of space. Oh, that's a beautiful shot. We had never had any discussion of uh, taking an Earthrise picture before the flight or during the flight. And yet when we came over the moon on this flight, we looked up and there was this beautiful blue ball in the, in the background. It all struck us immediately. Get that picture. This is the best picture we've got of the whole flight. It gave a contrast. It said that, hey, here are people looking from a different planet looking back at what is our home. When I looked at the Earth on the way back and had time to be a little more contemplative, it uh, underscored and got me thinking, really for the first time, we're just a small piece of an almost infinite universe. Before the flight, I was a Catholic and had communion from my old parish priest. But I must say that uh, my faith was somewhat undercut as I looked back at the tiny Earth and I imagined that if the Earth was the size of a golf ball, at one lunar distances, at 10 lunar distances, it was down to a BB. At 100 lunar distances, where it's hardly going anywhere in space, it's like a grain of sand. I got to thinking, is that really the center of the universe? When I was around the moon and I saw the Earth, I realized suddenly how insignificant we all are. Just tucked away in space around a rather normal star, the sun. Probably just one of millions of stars in the universe. I personally thought that everybody would like to have that view as we did to see the Earth as it really is. I believe all three of us had an emotional reaction to seeing the Earth. The dearest things in life were back on, back on the Earth. My family, my wife. What I uh, keep imagining is if I'm a some lonely traveler from another planet, what I think about the Earth from this altitude, whether I think it'd be inhabited or not. Well, I'm just kind of curious uh, whether I would land on the blue or the brown part of the Earth. You better hope we land in the blue part. The uh, target for the reentry 
was something like a mail slot if the mailman had to deliver your letter from 20,000 miles away. If we were too steep, we'd burn up. And if we were too shallow, we'd skip out, like skipping a stone on water. It always reminded me of like flying inside of a, a neon tube. It was uh, so bright. And every once in a while, you'd see chunks of the heat shield go flying by. I really don't know what, what I can say in a situation like this. We're very grateful for your participation. You stayed out here over Christmas. A lot of the attention gets focused on the flight crew, but there's a great, a great vast re reservoir of people that support us, and uh, I guess we all, we all did this, and we appreciate your help very much. Thank you. Everything that I held dear was on this earth, and I got off the airplane, and there it was. My family and my co-workers clapping and cheering. That was, uh, that was a very, very, that was probably the most emotional part of the flight for me is, is the, re the homecoming. People were going nuts. But just getting home was a, was a rewarding experience. There was a sense of uh, accomplishment, a sense of euphoria that we actually did it and it's completed and just think we were there and now we're we're back again we always somehow could not help knowing the enormity of what we did i knew that with nasa that everybody was elated you know and i was too but the accolades that suddenly came to us it was much greater than at least i expected Now, the question that we always receive, what was the most indelible of you? What, what do you bring back? What, what do you remember after this flight? And I must confess that uh, all of us, when we saw the Earth rising over the lunar landscape, said this was it. The picture that Bill took of the Earth from Apollo 8 became sort of the trademark of the mission. And everywhere we went, we presented that photograph uh, all over Western Europe, all over the Soviet Union. It was sort of uh, widely admired. I think people could identify with it because they were on that blue marble. Photograph itself was the thing that everybody liked. I mean, it represented Apollo 8. And it could be almost like saying it was the fourth astronaut because it was there and it did the job. One frame and showed uh, exactly our existence. So the one overwhelming emotion that we carried with us is the fact that we really do all exist on one small globe. And when you get out 240,000 miles, it really isn't a very large Earth. When people had time to uh, contemplate all that and let it sink in, that's what really made the Earthrise picture uh, one that uh, was considered a, such a, a valuable picture for the 20th century. I don't take much, you know, philosophical, artistic credit for that. I just happened to be there, had the camera, wanted the color film, and took the picture. Being unlikely poets, 
or not being poets at all, we have to turn to a very distinguished poet. And if I may, I'd like to read to you an excerpt from uh, Archibald MacLeish, because I think it captures the feelings that we all had in Moon Orbit. To see the Earth as it truly is, small and blue and beautiful in that eternal silence where it floats, is to see ourselves as riders on the Earth together, brothers on that bright loveliness in the internal cold, brothers who know now that they are truly brothers. Gentlemen, since you've now established yourselves by your own admission as philosophers, <laughs> I'd like to ask you a kind of a philosophical question. Do you think it's changed something in you? I notice, for example, you always refer now to the good earth. You're hardly able to say earth without saying good earth, as though you'd gotten some new affection for this ball. I, I don't think it's changed anything in me, but it certainly has amplified a feeling, basic feeling that I've had for many years about the the Earth, I, I think it first started when Jim and I flew in Gemini, and you realize that these boundaries we have are really artificial ones. Well, you mentioned about you know, the Earth receding, and uh, that feeling of mine of, that perhaps we wouldn't get back there, uh, which of course would be natural, if you could only transform that into everybody on the Earth that they really don't understand and realize what you have here until you leave it. I may be naive, but I think that we, uh, that we will eventually through the space program and through this space exploration of the away from the Earth and away from the totally nationalistic interests, we may uh, in some way uh, develop a closer relationship here among the, the people. I, think I, I firmly believe that. I don't think the Apollo program has yet uh, brought a, as worldly a view, uh, interlocking view to humankind that I had hoped. And even today when I hear people uh, chanting that we ought to go on to Mars, I'm thinking, you know, well, why don't we get our act together here on Earth first and go to Mars as human beings, not as jingoistic Americans or Chinese or Russians or Indians. Let's just do it as human beings. makes me feel a little bit disappointed. We did something that ended up showing the Earth and its people exactly how we existed, where we are, that we were really here on Earth, a, a spacecraft, and we were all astronauts. And whether we liked it or not, uh, that, that like we were in spacecraft having to work closely together to accomplish the mission, down here, we seem to not be able to do, to do that. It was a, uh, a very, very sobering look to see this beautiful little blue marble in the middle of all that darkness and to realize how lonely we really are on, on this wonderful Earth. And I think, it, I think it gave a lot of people hope and transcended national boundaries. Of course, things got back to normal rapidly, but at least for an instant in, in the history, I believe that people looked upon themselves as, a, as citizens of the earth. <laughs>